I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is a two-man race. So I'm here to report, we are very much alive! Joe Biden very much alive after a historic comeback. So how did it happen? And what happens next? And the issue is the coronavirus. Could this completely change politics in 2020? That and more with our all-star panel, Bob Schrum, Ariva Martin, and John Thomas, plus. Doctors have said to me, Katie, you've saved more people's lives than we have. The issue is cancer research. Our exclusive one-on-one -on -one with Katie Couric 20 years after a historic game-changing moment. The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. What a week it has been. I brought in reinforcements to help me explain it and break it down because I need help. My head's still spinning. Uh, the big picture, the Democratic establishment lined up behind Joe Biden in an unprecedented way to make Biden the front runner. This week, I actually spent time with both Biden and Sanders and talked about that issue of the establishment with both of them. We are taking on the corporate establishment. We're taking on Trump. We're taking on the Republican Party. We're taking on the Democratic establishment. We're taking on the insurance companies. We're taking on the drug companies. That's what we do. Establishment of all those hard work and middle class people and those African Americans, those single women. Yes, sir. Yeah. So if, like me, you are wondering what happened, how did this happen? We brought together some of the smartest people I know to help break it down. Bob Schrum has helped to run multiple presidential races over several decades in politics. A few weeks ago, he co-hosted our town hall with Mayor Pete at USC as part of his role, the co-director of USC's Dornsife Center for the Political Future. Ariva Martin is an attorney, activist, talk show host, and best-selling author. How does she have time for all of that? I don't know. Her latest book is called Make It Rain, How to Use the Media to Revolutionize Your Business and Brand. John Thomas, also here to use us today. He's a uh, top Republican strategist who founded TPS Strategies. He hosts the Thomas Guide podcast. He's a political analyst for KFI Radio. Welcome, all of you. Uh, some of our most here. frequent panelists, our all-stars are here, and we need our all-stars this week. Bob, let's start with you. You were here last week uh, when Joe Biden, there was talk about him potentially like being dead politically. All of a sudden now, he's very much alive, as he would say. Put this in some historical perspective, somebody who's been doing this for decades, to go from fifth place in Iowa and New Hampshire to now front runner after Super Tuesday. Well, as you know, I wasn't ready to write him off as dead a yeah, week ago. You were not. Uh, but this is unprecedented. We have never seen anybody recover as swiftly as he did. No one has ever lost those early primaries in that kind of shellacked way and then come back and become suddenly in a space of 48 hours the overwhelmingly likely nominee of the Democratic Party. And by the way, when you see that Bernie Sanders clip, he's just helping Biden with that kind of rhetoric because like African-American voters in the South, I don't think, regard themselves as part of the establishment. No, no, <laughs> really? in the South or anywhere. And, and that has been bothering me because n not only that statement about the establishment, some of the other uh, candidates, supporters, have really been challenging African-American voters and our wide support for Biden. Uh, some have called us low information voters, yeah. some of the South Carolinian voters. And, and I really take offense to that because first of all, African-American voters are some of the most sophisticated voters in the Democratic Party. And I think the candidates that didn't recognize the power of the African-American voters, they made a strategic mistake. So now it's not fair to somehow suggest that African-American voters aren't aren't smart enough to pick the candidate that they think is best to lead this country. Why do you think they're going for Biden in such big numbers, like 70 percent in Virginia? I, I think of it like this. Donald Trump has spent the last four years or three years trying to erase everything that Obama has done. So for many of us, I think it's the, the vision of having Joe Biden back in the White House is not just Joe Biden, but it's restoring the Obama legacy. And many of us believe Obama was one of the best presidents ever. And it's not going backwards. It's building on the success of one of the most successful Democratic presidents that there's ever been. John, you're a political tactician. From a political mm -hmm. tactician's perspective, mm -hmm. I, I feel like there was an establishment bomb that dropped on yeah. Bernie Sanders' <laughs> head, right? I mean, it was every single Democrat basically out there together coming together to take him out. What did you make of that as a moment? It was 
truly incredible. Uh, when they call it Jomentum, I mean, it's a, this is a <laughs> thing. I've never seen such fast movement, such quick consolidation. And it was really because leading into South Carolina, the Democratic establishment, pretty much everybody but the Bernie side, was freaking out at the concept that Bernie Sanders was the likely nominee. So it was amazing to see him come through. But put this in perspective on the size of the momentum. Do you know that Joe Biden had not aired one Super Tuesday ad uh, going into Super Tuesday? He didn't have a field office in California. He won states on Super Tuesday. He had never even visited. That it's, is wild. It's incredible how quickly everybody got on that bandwagon. So, Bob, if you're Bernie Sanders now and, and you're running that campaign, what do you do? Where do you go from here? Well, I have to be honest and say I think that he's well behind in Michigan. And if he loses Michigan, the race is effectively yep. over. He abandoned Mississippi, which sent another signal to African-American yeah, voters yeah. because they're the overwhelming percentage of Democratic voters there. But we shouldn't ignore, and I think John's right about this, the size of what happened with Biden, the sweep of what happened with Biden. It was also white women in the suburbs yes. who overwhelmingly voted for Joe Biden. And I think what's driving this race is something that we saw over a year ago in our first USC Dornsife LA Times poll. We asked people, what is the most important question you're going you're gonna to put to yourself when you vote? And the, and the answer was, who has the best chance to beat Donald Trump? Yeah. And rightly or wrongly, people have decided that Biden has the best chance to beat Donald Trump. And I think it's way too late for Bernie Sanders at this point to make that case. Can we talk about Elizabeth Warren yeah, and the well, women well, in this well, race? Let's get, let's get <laughs> to well, that. I mean, so that was, yeah, that was well, our I mean, next issue. Elizabeth yeah. Warren, she drops out. She says the hardest part of that dropping out is the pinky promises that she made with all of yes, the little girls, girls out there talking about uh, that there would be a female president. She says it's going to happen. It's just not going to happen right now. Uh, yeah, your your take on what happened with her? Well, I think what happened with her is the same thing that happened with all of the women. There was this big issue of electability. It kept coming up again and again and again. And people, even though they believed in Elizabeth Warren's message, they thought she was a great messenger, they had doubts about whether she could beat Donald Trump in a general election. I don't think it was an electability issue. I think it was she flubbed it. She couldn't explain her health care plan. She, she, she peaked too soon. Um, and if it, if it was an issue... That's not true, John. It, she explained her plan, no, and she was held to a she, different she, standard no. than Bernie Sanders was. He's never was forced to come she out and give details about his plan in the way that they forced that issue. It was with Warren to do. I think the do. truth is halfway in between here. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the fact you, is, you'll be the the fact is Bernie here. does explain how he's going to pay for it. He's going to raise taxes on the middle class. It's part of the revolution. And you're going to save money because you won't be paying health care premiums anymore. Right. And a very simple explanation. She gave a very complicated explanation. She didn't start out to run on Medicare for All. No, I think she decided she had to compete with Bernie for that constituency. And so she suddenly got herself caught up in it. And it was a very embarrassing moment in that debate when Pete Buttigieg said, how are you going to pay for this? And she didn't right. give an answer. And he said, you can't have a plan for everything but this. But the other thing I would add, by the way, is... And we saw this in, in, our, in our USC Dornsife LA Times data. The women candidates weren't being supported by women. Mm. And I think that was because the women who wanted to get rid of Trump were afraid after the Hillary experience of 2016 that there was a sexism that might make uh, a woman candidate less effective. Well, I don't think she was taken to task in the same way that Sanders has been, and I do think there's a double standard, and we would be remiss if we sat here and suggested that the female candidates in this race were treated the same as the male. They were asking Elizabeth Warren questions about her skin care routine, what kind of moisturizer so, she wore. Yeah. So the kinds well, of questions yeah. that well, she okay. got were very different but from the men. And it's until we address those issues of sexism, it, we're not going to have a female isn't president. Isn't it also possible that both those things are true, that sexism yes, played a role, but if you, at, if you look at if you look at the poll numbers, I mean, when the health care issue I, came I up, her Bob numbers started to I'm just disappointed. <laughs> but he has to agree with me on the same. No, 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 I think some of the questions that are asked of women are completely ridiculous. Right. Where yes. people say, I don't like that dress she's wearing or right. that yes. pants suit. I'm just right. Man, it's simple. You put on a sport coat <laughs> or a suit. I'm disappointed right. to hear that so many Democrats are sexist. I thought only Republicans were, so uh, that's news to me. Okay. Okay. Thank there, you. There you go. Right. <laughs> and so uh, here's a clip from Bernie Sanders' final California rally. The DJ there with a twist on a John Lennon classic. More than 15,000 people on hand saying power to the people at the L.A. Convention Center. Up next, a look at the California races and the biggest surprises. Stay with us. More of the panel right after this.
But all I say this is vote. And remember, we have a school bond on the ballot on March 3rd, Prop 13, yes on 13. Calvert Governor Gavin Newsom on the issue is pushing for the new Prop 13. That's a school bond. It's a statewide measure. Uh, yes, there are more ballots to count, but it appears right now that measure is going down. Let's take a look at the numbers with only 90 percent, over 90 percent of precincts reporting, about 55 percent no, 45 percent yes. Let's talk about that and more with our panel. John Thomas, Ariva Martin, Bob Shrum are back with us. John, uh, Prop 13, the other Prop 13, yeah. uh, appears to be going down. What's going on well, there? Well, it does. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see it. I think they should retire these prop numbers like jerseys. You know, like once they've been used, put it out. Good or bad, right? <laughs> yeah. 13, well, 187, 8, yeah, it's get just, them, get it's just them out. It's mass yeah. confusion. That, that was frustrating me, but uh, the Republican in me likes it because there were going to be tax increases at the local level as the devil was in the details on this particular bond. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a look at some of the most interesting races. First, for our viewers on Fox 11 Los Angeles, it's the seat to replace Katie Hill after she resigned. Here, Democratic Assemblywoman Christy Smith will face off against Republican Navy vet Mike Garcia. Interestingly, former Republican Congressman uh, Steve Knight, John Thomas, uh, mm -hmm. didn't appear to make the runoff in this, this race. This is one of those issues where uh, money is important. Knight had very, very little money, and it looked like the local GOP said, look, you lost it last time, we need somebody else. And it appears that the Democrats agreed because the Democrats were ruthlessly attacking Garcia because they didn't want to run against him because, look, he's a Latino in an area where there's lots of Latinos and he can run on a military background. Yeah, that's going to be an interesting one to watch. The uh, other open congressional seat, by the way, uh, is in San Diego. That's thanks to our viewers in Fox 5 San Diego. It's to replace Duncan Hunter, who resigned after his own indictment. So it looks like this race is going to be Democrat Amar Kampanajar, who lost in that last election there. He's going to face off against Daryl Issa, the former Republican congressman from a different district. So far, it appears that Issa is uh, going to defeat Carl DeMaio, a Republican talk show host. John, back to you on this one. Uh, what do you make of this one? Is this sort of a sure win for ISA? Yeah, it's effectively over at this point. I mean, the Trump is overwhelmingly popular in the district. The real thing was looking at that showdown between Carl DeMaio, who's a firebrand on the Republican side, versus Daryl Issa, who's a bit of a national brand. And it looks like they were both arguing about who loves Trump more. Yeah. And, uh, and ISA's and won. Yeah, and ISA's yeah. back. And Daryl will go back and now can once again be the richest person in Congress. Yeah, yeah. There's, sure. there's not the a lot of congressional races in California yeah. where who loves Trump the most <laughs> is the issue. Right. Uh, well, up next, we're going to talk about the coronavirus. Um, stars already starting to cancel their concerts because of it, mm. including Mariah Carey. <laughs> Her Hawaii show put on hold. Bob Shrum somehow is not going to be able to go. I know you have to cancel your trip. So we're going to talk about how all this is going to impact politics. Uh, we also want to hear from you about our show. Check out our website, theissueisshow.com. There you can check out digital extras, including podcasts with all three of our panelists here. You can send us an email, theissueisatfoxtv.com. More with our panel when we come back. Bob, this is where you can show off your moves. Come on, I know, Ariva. This is I'll, a, I'll take that time. trip to Hawaii for Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Fantasy. Is this your canceled. favorite or dream lover? It's dream lover? Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> Beethoven's ninth. Okay, Beethoven's <laughs> That's a proclamation uh, of a state of emergency in the state of California. Governor Gavin Newsom declaring a state of emergency over the coronavirus in California. So how does this impact politics here and nationwide? Back with our panel, Bob Shrum, John Thomas, and Ariva Martin. And guys, I've got uh, the tissue is box <laughs> in case. Probably case we you, can't touch case, that box you, now that you've touched it. And also, I think we're, we're, got a tissue. We're, we're supposed to, there, there it is. Uh, we're, we're, we're supposed to go um, six feet apart, right? So I guess I'll I'll do this the segment over here. Bob's already been coughing. <laughs> Just start. Um, yeah, yeah, Bob's so, coughing. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So uh, let's talk about that. I mean, we kind of joke, but it's also a pretty serious oh, thing, is. right? And yeah. we're starting to see people uh, unfortunately die in, in yeah. Washington State over this. Ariva, how do you think this sort of changes uh, politics going forward? I, I think it changes everything. This is the biggest test probably in Trump's presidency and how he handles it. And so far, he's been doing an absolutely admit abysmal job. Job. All of the inconsistent messages, not uh, you know, following and being consistent with what the scientists are saying. In fact, contradicting the scientists, trying to play it down, trying to tamp down information, not allowing the scientists to come forward and give the American people what 
information they need to keep themselves safe. Not having the resources available. I have a sister who's a physician in Tennessee and she says they don't have any test kits. Mm. So doctors all around this country are clamoring to get testing kits and they're not available. So it's a problem here in California as well. People are really scared and I think for real reasons. John. Well, look, I, I disagree. I mean, I think for once he's trying to calm people because we don't want markets overreacting because the fact is this could be devastating to the economy. We were talking about the, the devastation of the travel industry, the cruise industry, even the restaurant industry. Everybody's thinking twice. And I think it's important also to keep this in perspective that the flu kills more people right. annually than this. The difference is this spread so quickly that right. it could become. And there's and nothing we, and we calm, don't know. Uh, John, about misinformation. So let's be clear. There's one thing to, to try to, you know, help people feel confident, but you do not want to engage in a misinformation campaign. And that's what Trump has been doing, providing misinformation. You don't want to say it's a hoax. Yeah. Uh, because then you hear people on television repeating well, it back. Well, he wasn't referring, Maga, I know he was what, referring to a Democratic I, talking I, point. I, 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 you know, I, <laughs> I've, heard the, I've heard that explanation. I've heard that explanation, and that's about as good an explanation as Chuck Schumer's explanation for what he said in front of the Supreme Court. What people heard was hoax. It's going to change politics profoundly. Yeah. Uh, for example, as this thing builds up in the next two or three months, are we going to have these giant 18,000 person rallies? Or are politicians going to have to communicate in a different way. Yeah. Uh, maybe John will get some more ad revenue for, for commercials. <laughs> well, Joe Biden but will have an excuse for nobody showing up at his rallies. <laughs> oh, that, that's in the past. Yeah, that, that's in the past. That is really in the past. thousands of people <laughs> showing up at his rallies, but, trust me. But, so that's one impact it's going to have. The other impact, if John's right and it, it hurts the economy in this way, I think that's sort of the last read that Trump is leaning on to try to win the election. And if people think the economy is in trouble, Let, let's, he's done. He's toast. Let's throw out a conspiracy theory that the president himself um, downplayed this week, which is, is it possible that he's put Mike Pence in charge of the coronavirus? Because if he doesn't do well on the coronavirus, he can then blame somebody for the coronavirus and dump him and put Nick Haley on the yes. ticket. Yes. Yes. And the Pence, look, and Pence is not a member of the Trump family, yes. so he's disposable like Absolutely. everybody else. And whenever <laughs> Trump praises someone, beware, because typically right after all of the praise that's heaped onto you, you're probably going to be cast aside. And no doubt Trump is watching what's happening on the Democratic side. He's very concerned about one of these powerful women that we've been talking about becoming a part of the Democratic ticket. And how does he face a, a Democratic nominee with a female, powerful popular female on that ticket with Mike Pence. That's a problem. John, do you buy into that? I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, just crass, <laughs> but, but crassly speaking, Mike Pence served an important purpose in 2016 to calm evangelicals that Trump would give them what they want. And he doesn't need it now. And he has with the Supreme Court. So I wouldn't be surprised. Trump knows how to drive ratings, keep us guessing, and then switch it up last moment and throw yeah. somebody in there. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Well, that's something. Well, we got through this segment without having to use the tissue is. So that's a, that's a good news. We still have this here in case you need it. Uh, this week, by the way, the Ultra Music Festival was canceled due to the coronavirus concerns. Will Coachella be next to go? Of course, it's California's largest festival. Festival. Travis Scott said to headline there this year. That's a little Travis Scott music. Let's hope we get a handle on the situation. Everyone can enjoy this music in the Coachella Valley on our home of our affiliate, by the way, KPSP. Uh, we're, we want to thank our panel. Thank you guys for being here this week. Up next, we talk with Katie Couric about her life-saving cancer work and how you can get involved. And one last opportunity for you guys to, to dance. I saw that little, the little, the little, the little, the little deep shoulder Fair action. Next to me and yeah. I'll get him dancing. Yeah, there we when the issue is cancer awareness, no one has done more than Katie Couric. It's been 20 years since she made TV and medical history, and the fight continues today. Pretty little colon. <laughs> Actually, this is, this is good. 20 years ago, Katie Couric's on air colonoscopy on the Today Show inspired so many people to get checked. We've reached the end of the colon. Doctors termed it the Couric effect. So far, I'm looking so pretty far, clean. You're huh? very clean. It later helped to inspire stand up to cancer, raising hundreds of millions. Doctors have said to me, Katie, you've saved more people's lives than we have. It was nice to have a medical phenomenon named after me. Um, you know, all of this it was bittersweet. In 1998, Kirk's husband, Jay Monahan, lost his battle to colon cancer at just 42. I lost my husband, Jay Monahan, my loving and beloved husband, last month after a courageous battle with colon cancer. 
When Jay was diagnosed, I really didn't know that much about colon cancer. I didn't know it was the number two cancer killer of men and women combined. Kirk says after Jay's death, she was inundated with messages of support from viewers and inspired to use her platform to inform. As somebody who's lost somebody to cancer, I think you've been such an inspiration to all of us, so thank well, you. Thank you, you know, I think it's been really fortunate, honestly, Alex, that I've had a platform and that I've been able to take personal pain and transform it into advocacy and awareness. It's so good to see you all here. On her last day at Today, producers assembled cancer survivors living thanks to Katie. I am a survivor today only because you made me aware. Otherwise, I would have ignored my symptoms totally and I wouldn't be here today. I think when you think about the human beings behind the statistics and think about them still you know, leading full, productive lives. That is what gives me so much joy. Hey everyone, March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. 12 years ago, Couric helped co-found Stand Up To Cancer, uniting virtually every TV network and every big star to fund innovative work. Cancer does not discriminate. It affects one in two men and one in three women in this country. A person is diagnosed with cancer every minute of every day. Stand Up to Cancer supports 180 institutions, 1,600 scientists, and 26 dream teams of scientists. The premise of Stand Up to Cancer is that we focus on collaboration instead of competition. They received more than $600 million in pledges and funded six FDA-approved drugs. They are doing the work that will unlock the mystery of cancer. Of course, Couric has had one of the most celebrated careers in the history of broadcasting, but she says this work is her greatest legacy. The first line in my obituary, I hope, will talk about my cancer advocacy work because other than raising my daughters, it's my proudest accomplishment. Our thanks to Katie Couric for more on how you can get involved. Go to StandUpToCancer.org. We end with a performance from basically every top female artist ever from one of the Stand Up To Cancer benefit shows. I'm Alex Michelson. Thanks for watching The Issue Is. We'll see you next week. <laughs>